Hey everybody, it's the Lone Ranger coming to you from the upper village of Whistler, BC, Canada, and I have quite the bike review for you today. This is this bike has just been a giant question mark for a lot of people in so many different ways, from the geometry to the way it's made to how it's going to handle on the trail. And so Paul sent me up here to Crankworks on kind of like a mini press camp. They know that I've been riding the Evo Link 140 that they sent me last year, and now I'm going to try my hand at riding the machine. We're going to talk to Leo about the design philosophy about it. We're going to hit everything from top of the world to A-line and everything in between, so it's going to be quite the ride. So let's check out the bike. Pole Machine, a 180 millimeter front and 160 millimeter rear travel, 29 inch wheeled enduro brawler. Machined out of plates of aluminum at Pole's own factory in Finland, it is quite the head turner. This size large model sports 510 millimeters of reach, a 63.9 degree head angle, 455 millimeter chain stays, and a 79 degree effective seat tube angle. Now, those are some interesting numbers, right, but go. how does it ride? First lap. Brakes are going to be a little loud for a sec. She just got a wash. Woo. Oh, that's nice. So the first thing I have to mention, especially for people who haven't watched my channel before, is that this bike uh, and pull the company. Woo. Oh, that's good. Their whole thing is um, really kind of changing the game with as far as geometry goes. And the, my current bike is a Pole Evo Link, which has pretty much the same geometry as this bike. So for me jumping from my uh, Evo Link 140, size large, to a size large machine, it actually feels quite comfortable right away for me. Whereas somebody used to like standard geometry, which is shorter reach and shorter chain stays and all those sorts of things, and a steeper head tube, it can feel like a different experience and it can take a little bit to get used to sometimes. Whereas like my friend Josh hopped on this thing on the size large Evo link and was immediately comfortable. So it depends on the person. It's got a lot of travel for trail bikes, 180 millimeters of front suspension via 2019 Fox Lyric, <laughs> via a 2019 RockShox Lyric. And uh, it's first, first run of the day, okay? Give me a break. And um, 160 millimeters of rear travel on 29ers. So, on paper, this thing can tackle a lot. I mean, really, man, this bike's feeling good. I mean, really, if you think, a lot of the World Cup downhill rigs with 29 air wheels, a lot of them are running 180 mil. So, the front end of this bike is like World Cup downhill. So what I'm looking for is, ah, oh, interesting, is how this, handle, this bike handles the big stuff. The really chunky, bigger hits, gnar. Because when you're talking about a 29er with 180 mils travel up front, 160 in the back, like, that's a big bike. And for big things, Wow, it's a super -hoo -hoo, composed. Now we set the sag, it was really fast and easy to set. And I mean, it's a simple thing, but it's still a thing, is they set their sag using seated sag. So you literally just sit on the bike, take your feet off the ground for a second and then get off the bike. I think you set the sag that way, which makes a hell of a lot more sense than trying to like, okay, you gotta get up on the pedals, but you don't wanna, you don't wanna squish in the back or in the front too much. and. You want it to stay balanced, and then you got to get off really gently and carefully. I've never really understood that. They set the sag with seated sag, and then for front sag, it really just depends on feel. There's not a lot of point in setting a specific sag number. It's sort of like whatever works for you. you kind of start with the general recommendations from RockShox, and then Leo was saying you pretty much take it as high as you possibly can that's comfortable beyond that. Makes sense to me, nice and simple. That was kind of a weak wall ride. <laughs> the wood's still a little greasy from the rain, so I don't feel like crashing, especially because I'm by myself. Uh, goodbye, bike.
All right, so that's enough with the flow trails. It's time to hit some rough tech. Now, as you would imagine with a bike like this, it handled the steep and the rough extremely well. Like 29ers just by themselves handle beautifully in that kind of situation. And then you add in the 180 mil up front and 160 mil in the rear. And uh, it's very, it's, it has a very nice active suspension platform. Um, it doesn't feel cushy like a downhill bike does. It still has a trail bike snappiness or enduro bike snappiness, I guess you could say. But just like how I feel on my Evo Link with very similar geometry, almost exactly the same geometry, um, it's just super, super confidence inspiring as far as getting into the steep stuff, into the rough stuff and a combination of the two. There's just a whole new threshold when riding a bike like this as far as a, you know, a danger zone is concerned. So I found myself pushing even harder than I would on my Evo Link and definitely harder than I would on any of my previous bikes like my Giant Rain or Transitions or any of those other, other bikes with more standard style geometry. Through really fast successive hits, whether it was a bunch of rocks in a row like Rock Garden or a pile of roots that you have to go over, um, the back end kept up really, really well. I didn't do too much or really any setup at all with my suspension. I just kind of set the sag and I was off, just sort of trusting the standard tune that came on the bike. But then in the front, I did notice that the Lyric, it tended to bog down a little bit, even with a relatively fast rebound setting. And I recently read a review from Pinkbike saying the very same thing about the fork, which is interesting. Now, of course, this is only when you're going really, really fast over really chattery stuff. I notice it almost kind of sinking down and staying there. So it might take a little bit more tuning with the fork uh, to get a little bit more used to it. But as far as the really rough technical stuff, if that's the only thing I have to report, I'm doing pretty good. <laughs> Now, climbing. If you haven't noticed, I was doing this test for this bike within the Whistler bike park. So there wasn't a lot of climbing going on. I made sure to do some climbing up to, you know, we were doing some laps trying to find some interesting places to film. And so anytime I could, I would make sure to actually pedal back up that way. And I have to say that it pedals quite well. Um, it had the air shock on it, the rock shocks, compares to my Evo Link, which has a coil shock on it, which is even more active. So as far as actual suspension movement while climbing, I did notice that the machine tended to move quite a bit less than my Evo Link 140 or my previous Giant Rain uh, before that. It's a really good climber and I actually never felt the need to flip the pedal switch whatsoever. I just left it in full on open descend mode and it was good. I wanted to do something a little bit different because I had access to one of uh, Pole's professional EWS riders, Lee Johnson. So this is Lee, this is Lee Johnson. He's um, kind of a top 30 EWS racer, absolute ripper. And so I'm gonna put this poor, poor camera and gimbal on him so that you guys can get a feel of a professional speed on this bike. So let's check it out. So that was impressive. If any of you have ridden any of those trails, you'll know how ridiculous that was, especially in those conditions. I have never seen it so dry. Some of those corners on that first trail, I swear had dust this deep. Lee's a monster, an absolute monster on that bike. Now jumping, jumping, I mean, I'm not the best jumper in the world. I'm fine. I can clear pretty much everything on A-line, not everything, but mostly everything. I like, I like, ah! <laughs> he just jumped a squirrel. Woo! 
Yeah! Woo! She's handling good. Suspension set up really nicely, considering I had no part in it. I did find this bike <laughs> to be immediately comfortable in the air. It was very stable, as you would imagine, and uh, it was just a whole lot of fun. And I was going faster than I ever have before on A-Line, as a matter of fact. And Manuel. All right, this section is always bad for me. Let's see how we do. Whew. Oh yeah. Oh, it's so composed. That was really good on this bike. Woo! Now, speaking of having some pretty awesome access that you wouldn't normally see during a bike review, um, I was able to sit down with Leo. I cornered Leo from Pole, the man who designed the bike, the man who came up with the idea for how to build the bike and why to do it in such a different way. And so I sat him down, asked him a few questions. So here's the interview with Leo from Pole Bike Company. Enjoy. So uh, we are going to just kind of dive right into it. And one of the biggest questions I had, so when you're, when you're talking about a bike that's just so much different than anything else out there, um, why? Like, why, why would you do it? Aren't, aren't bikes good enough? Well, basically, the reason for it is that uh, I was riding downhill bikes, uh, more or less, and then I went to trail bikes and they didn't feel really good. And then I found out the trail bikes were pretty tricky on uphill as well. <laughs> Your behind is really on top of the rear triangle if mm. your uh, seat tube is slack and then i started studying why is it like that and because of the history of where mountain bikes come from and it's more or less road bikes road bikes <laughs> yeah you've seen all the different bike manufacturers inching closer and closer and closer with the enduro bikes to like you know slacker head tube angles longer top tubes um some some of them are going longer chainstays, although it seems like most of them are still hanging on to like short as possible kind of thing. So it was incremental steps, but what what made you decide to just go all the way and just kind of, because I mean like the, the uh, you can see the bike in the background there. If you basically cut that frame in half and only look at the front, that's basically a World Cup downhill bike with a single crown fork. Yeah. And then the back end is a very capable trail bike from what I've found so far. Yeah. So it's pretty, it's pretty revolutionary. So what, why, why did you think that that could work? Well, uh, first question, we didn't have any history. Mm. So I didn't have any burden of uh, kind of keeping happy or some of the customers happy who were already into the old school bikes. Yeah, you're starting fresh. <laughs> yeah, so I could uh, give a free thought and play around with ideas. Yeah. And uh, well, then when we test it, it's all based on a uh, stopwatch. So okay. now people are starting to think, is it, is it only for racing? No. Uh, when, uh, if we are uh, trying to define what's safe mm. and uh, like what is safe usually means that it's easier. Well, you can go with the same speed on the same section of uh, rock garden, for example, but you're not that on the edge. Mm. So okay. that's safer. It gives you more wiggle room. You can go faster as well. So for people who are not that fast, it, uh, allows you to kind of go to the next level of riding, so it kind of pushes you to the next step. Of so you're telling you're telling people that you can buy speed with this bike. Well, <laughs> if, uh, I have gained speed with this bike during yeah. the process. Uh, like we were talking about with the machine, I became faster. Yeah, and so what I found when I first started riding my Evo Link 140 was I was instantly. This is this is what I kind of expected. I was instantly faster in a straight line for sure, because it was that's more of a safe place to be and I knew I could push it further. And once I got into the corners a little bit, that's when I had to not relearn things, but just tweak the way like body positioning. What do you, what do you have, for the people that haven't ridden one of these before, what do you have to change to ride a pole Evo Link or a pole machine? Well, you need to unlearn the thing that you should be learned anyway if you look at the professional riders on short bikes they are pretty much in the middle of the bike mm. so mo uh, many people hang too much in the back yeah so in this on this bike you can more securely uh load the front end and yeah. be in the center of the bike so that's the idea so so the professionals are so good 
uh, balancing them, their position. So if you go from mountain bike to BMX, you realize what is the difference between well, like even the uh, like old school bike, you realize what means to be between the, the wheels and yeah. the center of the bike. Totally, yeah. yeah. I mean, you're kind of doubling down on, on the whole, uh, let's push things to what people might find extreme. So one, there's the geometry side of it, and two, it's the manufacturing process. And there's been a whole lot of talk and a whole lot of uproar over different things like, uh, you know, is carbon bad? Is aluminum any better? Is it what? Is this process any better in the long haul? There's, there's just so much talk and we can go really deep down the rabbit hole into that. But um, really quickly, just for the people that haven't, that don't know, why did you choose to build this frame machined out of aluminum rather than go carbon? Well, I had the carbon project and I uh, found out it's uh, not as clean as I would like it to be. Okay. And also we can kind of control uh, the quality with the big uh, factories. We cannot choose the materials properly. We cannot see what layup they're going to do. Mm. And then it would be a big risk to put the molds into one Chinese factory. And also the the Chinese wages are going higher and like people expect to get the carbon bike uh, in a certain uh, price range yeah. and now you can get like you said you can get uh, cheapest carbon bikes at what like under 1000 yeah you could buy a $400 carbon bike at Walmart now so <laughs> so it's not that high end uh, yeah. of course in uh, carbon fiber you can go really really high end yeah and that's the same thing with aluminum right. we have the highest end of aluminum here so it's 80 uh, percent stronger than conventional uh, aluminum but you can weld it really? so mm. um, you can't weld it you can't weld okay. it you cannot weld this uh, material what airplanes are made out of uh, mm. is this material okay 7075 aluminum yeah. and they glue it on airplanes as well so there's technology behind. So we didn't invent that the technology. Okay, next question. Um, the link itself. Yep. So there's a bike called the Evo Link. Yep. Is that's is that an Evo Link linkage, or is that something different? Uh, we haven't kind of uh, made a name. You don't have a sweet it. acronym for it yet. No, that, <laughs> that's what I was actually not not liking yeah. in modern biking industry. That you need to name everything with something, so okay. it's a four bar yeah. uh, linkage. So uh, with short links. So mm. that's the the kind of engineering term for it. Okay. So, so for me, um, being not super educated on the specifics of different linkages and how they operate. Um, when I see like a VPP system from like my old M9 yep. and the way that the linkages just look to the eye, there are similarities between that and this. Are they very different? Are they similar? Are there similarities to VPP? Well, mechanically, they are close to each other. Mm. VPPs, uh, one of the links rotates the other direction, which doesn't really matter. Uh, basically, it all comes to stiffness and the leverage curves and anti squat. Uh, so the kinematics are what you need to look at, not necessarily how the the links are built. It gives me the right type of uh, leverage curve and anti-squat uh, characteristics and the stiffness of the bike. And also we can get good tire clearance okay. and blah, 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 blah. Yeah, There's yeah. a lot of- There's a lot of positives. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I guess that's the job of an engineer is to balance out the positives and the negatives. Yeah. Who, who's the customer? Who, who, who buys this bike? Who should buy this bike and who would enjoy it the most? I don't think it's a good way of starting a company just making market research right. and oh, people would love this. Yeah. But you're already right, late there. You need to have some kind of innovation. And uh, I just started to design the bike how I would like the bike to be and uh, went from there. I want a bike that has a huge range of uh, riding. Yeah. Well, this was really great. Thanks for uh, answering some of my questions. I really appreciate it. Cheers, man. Cheers. So my final thoughts on the pole machine. There was a very good reason why about a year ago, almost a year ago today, I first emailed Poll asking questions about the bike and wanting to know more. It's because it's unique. There, there's so much promise in what they were offering and now with the Poll machine, also with the manufacturing process as well, could they deliver on these promises of making you faster on the trail and having a safer bike to ride? And with the Pole EvoLink 140, I believe that was the case. And now trying out the machine, very similar experience, and it's a refined experience. It pedals really nicely and yet still stays very active. It's snappier in the corners than I believe my 140 is. And it just lends itself to going really, really fast. 
And we're not just talking straight line speed, we're talking in the corners and jump lines and everything else. Like it's just a fast, fun bike. And that's what it comes down to. You know, like here's the thing, all bikes nowadays, all new bikes are really good. They're so capable in so many different ways, but it comes down to uniqueness with this bike. The uniqueness with the way it's produced, the angles of geometry and how all that comes together to be a one of a kind, not only work of art, but speed machine. So if that sounds good for you and you're in the market for a premium bike like this, definitely go check out the pole machine. I don't think you'll be disappointed. So thank you very much for watching this review. If you'd like to give it a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe. I mountain bike all over the world, put out some pretty fun content and I'd love to see you there along the way. If you wanna see more videos of me, you can go check out this video right here or that one right over there. And if you wanna support the channel, go check out the Patreon channel over there. Cheers everybody, have a good one.